A warm welcome to this afternoon's uh, Danish-Finnish webinar. My name is Gunvo Kronman. Uh, I'm the CEO of Hanna Holmen, the Swedish-Finnish Cultural Center. I'm also the Secretary General of the Finnish-Danish Cultural Foundation. The Cultural Foundation for Denmark and Finland was, uh, has been organizing discussions on different topical issues over the past years ranging from labor market reforms and policies, housing policy, and other social and economic issues. Today, uh, we have identified a very relevant and timely topic for uh, a Finnish-Danish discussion. The theme of the seminar today is a post-pandemic path to success. What can Denmark and Finland learn from each other in this very special time? We have two very prominent and interesting guests discussing with us today. We have the Finnish Nobel laureate and Paul A. Samuelson, professor of economics um, emeritus from MIT, uh, Bengt Holmström. And we have the professor of economics at Aarhus University, Torben M. Anderson. And this discussion is led and moderated by journalist and writer Annuka Oksonen. We're really pleased to have you here with us today. Denmark and Finland have both been labeled internationally as quite good examples of managing the COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic. At this point of the crisis, uh, and according to experts, the approach of shutting down in the beginning quickly, but not completely, and then reopening sometime later has been fairly successful. Today we will discuss what is behind this Nordic strategy and what measures could pave Finland's and Denmark's way to successful transition into a post-pandemic time. We have now the great opportunity to hear two lead world-leading experts uh, having their opinions concerning these questions and to learn from one another. So I will now invite Anuka Oksanen to begin this discussion with our guests, please, and enjoy the next 60 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Kunvor, um, and hello from Denmark. Uh, I'm Anuka, the moderator, and uh, Bengt, good morning to the US, and uh, Torben, good, morning to uh, good, good afternoon to Denmark, and also good afternoon to everybody who is attending and um, following this discussion. Um, let's begin with the uh, current situation and the, the coming winter. Uh, Bengt, you followed the situation closely in the spring in Finland as a member of the advisory group for the Finnish economic policy. Um, and that went well, but now the pandemic is picking uh, up pace again. Where are we now and uh, what can we expect? Yeah. Let me first say thank you for inviting me and for it's uh, it's really nice to be here with an old friend Torben and uh, and and try to try to give some insights into this uh, highly complicated or uh, highly unusual situation. Uh, uh, the pandemic is still ruling, so to speak, and and determining what's happening. Uh, it's a very unusual, uh, even for coronavirus, a very unusual. Virus and uh, and I think the reason it has uh, has gotten so much more attention is partly because it's uh, it's very capricious. We don't understand exactly how it spreads. It uh, it hits people unexpectedly and brutally, and some others are completely uh, unaffected. You know, it's more like a tornado. Uh, it comes and goes, and and that instills a lot of fear in people. And the fear is what has paralyzed the economy. So the economic impact is partly a consequence of this, uh, this erratic pattern of the, of the virus. Uh, that said, uh, I have been part of an interesting study uh, with, with some colleagues uh, at, uh, that tried to establish whether the COVID is seasonal in the way that, uh, that the, or, most coronaviruses are seasonal. That is, uh, they are very regularly on the northern hemisphere. They are at the, they they sort of pop up in the fall and get to their maximum strength sometimes mm -hmm. in the turn of the year. 
and then disappear in the spring and, and certainly in the summer. And, and that pattern has been seen in the north this way and in the southern hemisphere just reverse. That is, their peak is in, in, in June, July. Uh, so there is a reason to think that, uh, that COVID is seasonal, but uh, because it's so aggressive, I think there's so much uh, interventions that have been done that we don't really see the underlying pattern. It's pretty clear that, uh, that unlike the other coronaviruses, we are not going to manage this virus just by letting it run its course. So uh, it's harder to discover, but there's one point I want to emphasize is that this seasonality comes from the fact that uh, in the fall, uh, when the, it's really probably or possibly UV light, which we know that kills viruses, we know that it disinfects, probably the UV light that is a strong component. And that means that in the fall, when the UV light in the northern hemisphere and especially further away from the equator intensifies, then the virus, uh, I'm sorry, declines, then the virus gets more aggressive. And, and you can see that pattern, you know, if you study and, and correspondingly, it's the reverse, as I said, in the Southern hemisphere. So we saw the peak, for instance, in South, America, South Africa in, in June, July, we, see, we saw it in Chile, but there are aberrations like United States is very hard to understand and explain. So I think we have still a lot to learn about the virus, which of course keeps us worried. But that doesn't really sound like good news for us now. No, there is a good news, which is I think if, if it were seasonal and established that pattern, yes, right now it's, we, we should really be concerned. But on the other hand, the good news is of course that uh, we don't, we, we would know that in the spring it's going to go. So I, I think knowing that it's seasonal and becoming seasonal in that sense is a good news because then it's not totally arbitrary. Yes, yes, it's very interesting. We we just saw here in Denmark during the last couple of days uh, how how difficult it is to um, to predict how the virus uh, works because it uh, the infections have shut up and now there's current. Yesterday there was 945 per day, which is which is quite a bit for Denmark. And Torben, you have also been involved in the um, forming the crisis policies in Denmark, and you've been also talking about predictability. Uh, How has that worked, in your opinion, in Denmark? And for instance, right now in the current situation, you you, you should said yourself just before we <coughs> came on the air that situation has changed quite dramatically now. Yes, uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this uh, discussion on a very important issue. Uh, and yes, it's true that the situation has really changed uh, radically within a short period of time, uh, stressing uh, Bengt Holmström's point about the, the uncertainty and the difficulty in, in predicting this. Uh, of course, after the what happened in the spring, there was discussion about the second wave and so on. But during the summertime and the, the, the low number of cases and so on, I think it sort of, many people were thinking, well, maybe there will not be a second mm -hmm. wave and so on, but now, now we have it and, um, It's creating a lot of problems and the fear, of course. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion and demand for having sort of a kind of a schedule that the, the, the authorities or the government could say, if we are with this number of virus cases, then this or that would happen. But what we see now is it's extremely difficult to make this kind of continued uh, plan. What we are trying to do now in Denmark is a bit different from what we did in the spring. And you could say we learned something So we're trying to avoid, at least for the moment, trying to avoid a general lockdown, uh, trying a more sort of, um, you can call it differentiated approach, uh, uh, basically uh, with the, the most severe consequences for the private sphere, ho hoping, that, hoping that we can keep businesses opening, open and uh, also educational institutions and so on. But it relies very much on uh, behavioral uh, responses And the basic idea is, of course, to minimize the economic consequences of this second wave. And yes. it's uh, way too early to say whether that uh, yes. is going to be successful. Yes, yes. What, what if, um, considering now what uh, Beng just said, what if it's true that it's strongly seasonal? So in your opinion, what should be now done in, in Finland or and, and Denmark? What would be the right response? Do you, Torben, want to say something first and Bengt maybe then after? 
Well, first there's the issue of the uh, the health motivated restrictions and whether the ones we have now introduced uh, last uh, Friday in Denmark would be sufficient or, or whether we can avoid uh, more severe uh, restrictions and eventually a uh, lockdown. That's obviously crucial. On the uh, economic policy side, it's it's a bit difficult because we, we have had these so-called emergency packages. Uh, they were launched uh, very quickly in March. And uh, the basic idea was to protect uh, companies, mm. firms, and, and jobs, uh, but also that this should be temporary because uh, this is a new type of economic policy and, and that type of support uh, has a huge, not only budget cost, but also structural cost in terms of impairing adjustment and so on. And if we are now looking into something which would last, say, six months or something like that, uh, maybe a little more before we are in, uh, in really springtime, then, of course, it's a difficult issue. Uh, how would you design these packages? Does it make sense to try to support uh, certain areas of business for that long uh, with the risk that you support something which doesn't yeah. have a future? So that's really a yes. very difficult question. Yeah, they are really complicated issues because then you can end up supporting completely maybe wrong thing. Yes, Bengt, what about you? You also mentioned fear. Is it the fear that we should be more afraid of? even than no, the virus. Fear, I mentioned fear because they have measured, uh, these are difficult things to measure, but in the US there was a, a well-known study that looked at county, county level data, meaning looking at counties, which are pretty small mm -hmm. units to see, you know, what, how big an effect was restrictions of various sort and how, how big effect was it just that people didn't want to go out or they didn't want to go to restaurants yes. and so on. The hospitality industry, of course, has been hit very hard. And they concluded it, it, it is this fear is abs the dominant thing. So of course it can be driven itself by, by government action, actions taken. So I think there's that on that ground, there is a solid uh, reason to think fear is big, certainly it applies to me and my generation. You know, I'm, I'm 70, you know, uh, whoever you talk to, they are pretty careful about uh, the way they yes. travel. Yes. Let, let me just comment on Torben's, uh, or second rather, what Torben said about, I think the first measure to take uh, is, uh, is defensive. That is, we should protect each other and ourselves in, in this way. And, and, uh, and I'm glad to see that finally masks are appearing. We don't know the effects of masks exactly, but it's hard to believe that it doesn't, that it does anything. That's an obvious thing to do. And we could also look at, uh, at Asia. You know, Asia has seen these things many times over. Africa has seen this many times over. They are doing a lot better than we because they have a long experience with viruses of this sort. And they, so why not look at the people who have experienced this, uh, this so many times? Uh, in various sorts. So I think we have been just, uh, just in some sense, uh, fortunate not to have these kinds of pandemics or, or big illnesses and, and uh, I would say almost, almost, you know. So that's the number one. The other one is just like Torben said, I would, I would emphasize that we, if we were a village or small community, we would share risk. That's clear, you know, we wouldn't leave people just say too bad that, that, yes. that you are without a job or your job is taken. So I, I'm in favor absolutely to sharing risk. And uh, it, despite the fact that uh, what Torben said, that, that they, it does a lot of structural damage, but if one is very, we aren't going to see this very soon again. So I, I think sharing mm -hmm. risk, how much is a different question, but, uh, but definitely, you know, I think this massive support mm -hmm. is a way of basically sharing this the way the village would do it. And 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 doing it in a complicated and complex situation. So, so it's going to be dealt with eventually, I believe, with inflation or taxation or whatever it is. But that's the way life is when something as big as this is. So we sh we should now concentrate on taking care of the acute situation, and then very later, how to deal with the uh, expenses that it creates. I mean, Nordic countries have done it very well. I'm not advocating for accelerating necessarily what we are doing, but we have done it. I mean, yes. we have systems in place where the risk sharing is much more efficient, say, than in the United States yes. or somewhere else. Yes, 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 yes. Um, 
from there we can con conveniently come to labor market because uh, rising unemployment is a big big concern for many people yeah. at this time, both personally and also the policymakers. Mm. And we have the Danish model and in Finland, there's the furlough scheme that many countries have been looking at now. Um, Torben, what do you say? Because uh, unemployment in Denmark is typically lower than in Finland. Like um, I checked the recent, recent figures, now it's 4.9% uh, in Denmark and in Finland it's around 76 I gather. Is it the Danish model, the flexi, flex security, or that model that explains the three percentage points uh, different in this? And how, how does this work in the crisis? Uh, yes, uh, clearly the, the Danish labor market structure is, in, is uh, part of the explanation why sort of over many years we have had uh, very low unemployment. Uh, on yes. the corona crisis, the jury is still out. If we take the sort of the first wave, and mm -hmm. related to what Bink was uh, saying, you could say that what we did with these emergency packets was really collective risk sharing or, or insurance. And we protected mm -hmm. businesses and we collect, uh, protected the uh, workers' jobs. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that had this insurance effect, but it also had the effect of maintaining production capacity and, and job matches such that when we could uh, go out of the lockdown phase, uh, the economy could easily, uh, or at least more easily, uh, pick up again. And, and that's yeah. really what we saw uh, over the summer. And uh, if you look at recent report from the Economic Council in Denmark, which was before the second wave, they, uh, they really said we have been in a, this a V pattern, a huge hit due to the lockdown, and then we are almost or very close to being back on, uh, on track. So in that sense, the first phase of this uh, worked uh, quite well. Um, of course, there's some additional explanatory factors related to what was just mentioned that we had the, as generally in Northern European countries or in Scandinavia, we are usually very careful with fiscal policy. So that means that when there is a crisis, we have the fiscal space to do these things. These, these programs have been very expensive, but we can, we can deal with that. Um, the, the specific structure of the Danish economy is also important. We have our exports are very um, much concentrated on food and uh, pharmaceuticals, and they are not so uh, business cycle dependent, or at least for this type of uh, cycle. And then also we entered this with an, uh, an economic situation which was extremely sort of favorable. We were sort of any macroeconomic indicator pre the Corona crisis were just yeah. fine. We were really without any problems. And of course, it's easier to cope with a crisis if, if the economy is sort of in pretty good shape when you, uh, you're hit by this uh, negative shock. Mm -hmm. So there are many things going into this, um, but it's, it seems that so far that the labor market has, has, of course, unemployment has gone up, but not as severely as you might have anticipated given the, the yeah, the, the how hard they, we were hit by this thing, yeah. Yes, 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 banked. Uh, yes. I add uh, again, and I much second what, uh, what Torben, Torben is saying, the Nordic countries has managed this, uh, this rather well so far. Uh, there is a sort of first insurance phase. At some point we, we have to, in Finland especially compared to Denmark, we have to get more flexible job market. We cannot just let people, you know, stay in their jobs if uh, this is the structural problem that uh, that you pointed to, Torben. So, so I, I think we are going to see by necessity, absolutely more flexible, uh, to, you know, job markets. Uh, again, I'm making the reference to the primitive societies, you know, they, they would not have people just stand there and do nothing. They would move and look for new opportunities and, and, and there are new opportunities. So that's the downside of the insurance, of course, that if, if people, people may, may not uh, feel like they feel a need. It also includes, by the way, a lot of re-education and, and education. And there we see that, uh, that opportunities are great, you know, in terms of, uh, of using the net and, and learning skills. Mm -hmm. The job markets are becoming more skill oriented. That is, uh, at least in the U.S., uh, you know, uh, degrees like I'm I'm such and such engineer or I'm such and such uh, you know academic of various kinds. 
that's uh, that's less significant, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays itself out. People are being asked, uh, "Do you know how to how to handle data, say, or something like that?" And if you know how to handle data, they don't ask where did you learn it. They are they are they, they are just fine with the idea that you know data. So there's a there's a democratization in that sense in the educational sphere that, that I think, especially young people, I would I would urge strongly to 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 go and look at it look at that road, especially if things are closed and, and closed up. And we should use this, uh, this time to shift, shift uh, you know, into the new areas. It, it's not worth looking back uh, and say, we are just, we are not going to go back to where we came from. We, we are going forward. And that mindset that we are going to forward is, is, uh, is really, really extremely important and, and, uh, and uh, to plan accordingly. That the world has already changed, and we are not going back to the pre-pandemic way of uh, handling um, em employment either. No, I don't think so. I mean, there are, it's not you know there are, there are things that will go back to normal. I think I think restaurants will come back. I think restaurants will do mm -hmm. just fine eventually. You know, people need food. People enjoy sitting and talking to each other. You know, there's a lot of that's going to come back. I think pretty quickly. But uh, there's also permanent changes, especially in digitalization, you know, the, the distance learning, distance uh, work, working from home. It's, it's early to say, but the longer this lasts, I think the, the, the bigger the change okay, will okay. be. And, and my point is just that we better prepare for it, you know, and not uh, look back and, and wait for the door to open again. Yes. But would this like the, well, in Finland, we obviously say that when it's going badly, it's not a good time to start to change the system and not also when, it, when it's going well, it's not a good time either. What is, as an economist, what do you say, you know, beginning to change the labor market more, more flexible or the whole, it's a, it's a big thing to do because it involves so many cultural things and institutions. Well, I think it's a combination of, of, of of ensuring at the same time as you are, are shifting also jobs. You know, you have to be willing to take jobs and, and, and local, local negotiations, which we have seen starting, I, I think it's inevitable in this, uh, in this situation. And yes. that doesn't mean that the workers are left, you know, alone. And, and uh, we, we have to find other ways of ensuring people properly. Yes. Uh, be that some some uh, you know a permanent income so of some mm. sort or something, but but we can't you know sacrifice our sort of a productive capacity by yes. by by staying with the old. Yes, yes. This this um you already talked about the education and, and innovation. Um, it's very interesting the how you how you developed how the whole system of uh, the, your skills. What, what are the essential skills is, is changing. Has the, um, the virus now changed some, some other ways, the perspectives in innovation? Would, it, would, would there be something good that could come out of this? Uh, if you think about small countries like Finland and, and Denmark. Well, all crises tend to stimulate innovation by necessity. And, and uh, if, 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 you, if you have to find food, so to speak, you know, uh, if your stomach is empty, you become more innovative. Every language has its version of, of saying that a necessity is the mother of invention. So I, I think in that sense, it, 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 there is going to be a wave of, of innovation and, and people have the opportunity to do that. And in that regard, I think uh, digitalization is, is, of course, much talked about, but it is just the fact that that everything that can be digitalized, so to speak, will eventually be digitalized. And, and, and you know, now it's accelerating because of the crisis. That's one of the things we see, we see this. Uh, you see it in the stock market. I mean, you see, which, you know, it's very uneven. You know, it's amazing how high it is, but it's, it's riding on actually fairly narrow shoulders, which is, you know, the tech companies and some, some of course, some medical companies and so on. But uh, I think that is an indication that uh, that we are, the people believe the new you know technologies will come to rule you know the the in the future and and so so that's my view about it. I think there's going to be a lot of innovation. There's going to be a lot of errors, but uh, you know, like Thomas Edison said, well, he was asked how how do you become more innovative? His his recommendation was fail more. 
Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Torben, um, uh, how do you see this in Denmark? What would be the government role in um, crisis time, crisis time com combined with the innovation? Yeah, yeah let, let me start by uh, coming back to, to something Ben mentioned and, and, and which yeah. I agree very much in, in terms of what is going on now and, and the insurance and, and structural reforms. Uh, if you have a shock which is sort of uh, short-lived temporary, it makes sense to support income. But if it uh, has a longer duration and if structural changes are involved, you can still have insurance, but other, another form, let's just call it active, in the sense of retraining, education and so on, help people find uh, other jobs and perhaps even uh, in some cases uh, better jobs. So having reforms is not uh, the same as just saying that you leave everybody to themselves and they only the, the fittest would uh, survive. There are many things you can, can do in terms of uh, labor market policies, educational policies, and so on. And also related to what was discussed, namely that when we have a, a there's no crisis which would not have structural implications. Um, there will be some new things coming out, but they will also uh, speed up some structural changes which were already uh, in the process. For instance, uh, uh, e-commerce is not a new thing. It has been with us for some years now, but obviously due to the lockdown mm -hmm. and all these things, it has had a really uh, peak <laughs> in e-commerce. It's unlikely that it would return to the level before. That would of course have negative consequences for uh, retail business. Mm -hmm. uh, working from home was not a new thing, but many of us have now experienced it. Maybe we don't want to be 100% working at home, but the idea of working at home is not uh, 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 no longer sort of uh, a new thing to us. Mm. Um, supply chains, uh, many other things are, are going to change. So I think it's also important that economic policy is not designed with a status quo bias. We think that you can bring the economy back to how it looked uh, early March uh, 2020 or, or something like that. Mm because there are always structural changes in the economy and some of them are now speeded up yeah. and we have to make sure that we adapt to them. Yes. Have the, have the Danish or Finnish politicians have been able to do that when they have been do, planning these packages? Is it even politically possible to do it so that you don't um, aim for the status quo from the beginning of the year? That's a very, very interesting question. I think if I take Denmark as an example, yeah. as, as this is too early to definitely answer your question, but there's some small steps have been taken. Um, when the when we were struck by this thing, there was uh, uh, the social partners agreed on a so-called wage compensation scheme, yes. which was to protect yes. jobs and, and workers. Um, that has expired, but now there's a new kind of, it's called a work sharing arrangement. But it has this element that, that, that there can be training elements in the work sharing. So that's preparing you to, to other types of jobs or functions, uh, new qualifications and so on. Yeah. So it, it is this idea that there might be a need to, to adjust. I'm not claiming that this would <laughs> do all uh, the job here because uh, them, this is just a small part, but it's just an illustration that, that you can, uh, you can design these uh, programs mm -hmm. so that you also promote uh, adjustment. Yes, yes. Okay. Do we look enough, uh, are we enough future oriented in Finland? <laughs> it's a little hard to answer that question. I think I think people are starting to understand that we, this will be with us for a while. And, yes. and that it's not both waiting for a vaccine or something else, it comes when it comes. And, and that would be a great thing, but we can't, just stand here. And I don't think people are doing that either in Finland. I think, I think they have reacted. Let me point to one opportunity that I have, uh, I have pushed a little bit. Uh, in addition to this pandemic, we, we have a special president here in the United States who has, who has in an unprecedented way, closed mm -hmm. immigration, essentially. And taking, uh, so, so this used to be a place where a lot of international students came and, and, and got their visas and felt safe and so on. And, and now they feel uh, less than safe. And I, I think a, a number of students, uh, both for the pandemic, but I think for the duration also, are going to be more hesitant to come here into the United States. And, and this creates an opportunity 
uh, for for I think uh, uh, Europe and it creates some, and and China by the way similar is isolating itself. So I think this creates an opportunity for Europe to expand on 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 on, on the programs in going to the talent market, so the international talent market, and and also the international educational market. So I I would strongly urge, uh, you know, certainly Denmark as well and Finland, uh, it's, it's good for all of us if all of us get more international uh, students and more international uh, workers, you know, skilled labor, mm. but I'm talking about skilled labor. It, it, change, it really takes a big change in mindset because skilled labor has opportunities still, a lot of still. So one can sort of let them in. One should be recruiting them in. And, and in an active recruiting mode, that's how you get skilled labor and, and, and also create a broad range of infrastructure in terms of, uh, you know, educational for, for, the, for the whole family. So you don't just bring one person in and, and the family suffers on the side. So I, I think that's one thing that, uh, that Finland has to do in the long run. And, and this is a very good moment to, to do it. Mm -hmm. It's politically, again, um, economically, it would make a lot of sense, but politically, in this um, current political climate, it's a very big issue, this, uh, this immigration thing. I know it is, but, uh, but as I said, uh, we have to do it, or we will mm -hmm. face the consequences later on. And, and yes. I, I think it could start, by the way, with, with uh, being more active on the, on the distance learning and, and, and such things, for if we talk about students. Or like uh, universities. It's a, it's a good, yes, it's a good opportunity. And, uh, and, 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 you know, the Nordic countries are pretty advanced with digital, uh, you know, and, and they, the Nordic countries, if one looks at the US, they look very good. That is, Nordic countries are being admired, probably excessively so, but they, it's a good moment. We are, we are, we are sort of our, our brand name is very good right now yes. in the world. Yes, and getting better all the time, the better we take care of the, the crisis. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Torben mentioned earlier supply chains and, and you talked about China um, isolating. Um, that is kind of part of the same, this innovation and this issue. What, what, what do you think will happen to supply chains now? And are there possibilities there for Nordic countries like Denmark and Finland? Yeah, well, what we see is that we really had optimized for a world that works perfectly. And markets work perfectly, and this, and this, uh, we now learn what uh, <laughs> that you know. One has to have, so to speak, real insurance. Also, one has to diversify product, you know, supply chains, and and one has to bring home, you know, certain certain production. You know, I think even all the way maybe to food and such things to secure against uh, against these kind of pandemics. And so you will see it's going on right now, and and and. I think it's not going to come, that part is not going to come back necessarily that quickly, or it's become more smartly. And businesses, by the way, have been surprisingly fast at adapting to this yes. situation, the big businesses. And yes. so uh, I worry, on, I, I don't know if it's a worry or not, but you know, China and the United States are battling in a way that I think, I think the world is going to be more separated. And, and one thing is that China, actually, I think they are realizing they don't really need Asia. They don't really need Europe. If yes. Europe needs China more, Europe and, and America needs China more than China needs them. Yes. And, and, uh, and, and so they are incidentally, one of the things I would strongly urge, despite all the talk about human rights, China is the head of, of, of Europe a lot and even ahead of Silicon Valley in the US in a number of places, a lot. So it, it would be very destructive or, or, or unwise, I would say, for America as well as, as Europe to not you know, keep track of what's happening in China. And, and so uh, that's another thing I would say. Yes. But yes, uh, <laughs> your supply chains, by the way, are going, the world is going to be globalized again because yes. such efficiency is to be had, but yes. probably in a divided way still. 
Yes. Is, is this uh, talk and talked uh, in Denmark now in connection to the crisis and, and the recovery, these like uh, exactly supply chains or the connections to China? If you think about the economic point of view, or is it more in the back burner? Oh, it's a theme uh, and a lot of discussion about it. Of course, uh, the Danish industry structure is that we have many very small firms and they are actually quite well integrated in the supply chain, yes. uh, for instance, in the car industry and many other things. So um, I think in that sense, maybe there's also part of the, some of the robustness of the Danish economy that we have really a very diversified uh, structure. It also has some drawbacks because we don't have very many very big firms and so on, but all these small ones with with their comparative advantage in in this uh, uh, allocation uh, across the, the globe, so so uh, that's just very important for Denmark, and I, I uh, expect that would still be the case, obviously. Yes, 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 and and like this this wouldn't be enough now dealing with this. What you and uh, Bengt were just talking about, we have even a, the pandemic is a big crisis, but we have even a bigger crisis at our hands, which is climate change and the declining biodiversity. Yeah. Um, uh, how to deal, how, for instance, we take Denmark. How, how would you say Denmark has uh, taken this into account now when planning the recovery from the crisis or at the crisis? Yeah. There are very few concrete uh, mm -hmm. steps being taken, but there's a lot of discussion Obviously, we have the climate targets, yes. and there's a discussion about uh, or the, the possibility of uh, when you prepare for the recovery, can you combine this so you sort of uh, prepare for a new, more greener uh, yes. production and, and so on. Uh, in the first place, most of this discussion is on the investments, that if you want to pursue a more expansionary fiscal policy and you want to push uh, investments to... Mm. to maybe kickstart the economy, then, of course, that's an obvious place where, say, why don't you have these investments such that you support mm. the uh, climate transition? Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think the two things, or the many things, but the two key things one should be uh, uh, keep in mind here. One is that you cannot achieve the, the, the climate transition just by investments. You have right. to target the, uh, the externality. That's the, the CO2 price. You can do this uh, in, in many ways by a CO, CO2 uh, tax or other ways, but without that, it, you cannot reach these uh, things. The other thing is that um, you, there's a risk that because it's very popular and policymakers think, well, we, we promote these so-called green investments. Mm. But there's a huge risk that you have um, in the short run or investment in techniques which will be obsolete in just a matter of uh, one or two years. Uh, because this is really a, a matter of making a transition. But I think clearly it makes sense to, to prepare for this transition in the investments. Mm. But what I'm trying to say is that that would not do it uh, in itself. No. No. Yes, yes. Bengt, what about you? Do you want to comment on, on Torben's uh, views? It's closely connected to innovation as well, all this. I, I would just say a word about the, the, the big concern about the climate, which is obviously, uh, that's not going to go away quickly. Com mm. and, and, uh, and the one comment is that I, I believe more in a smaller, from smaller efforts than this uh, global sort of agreement type of effort. I, I just, uh, these big yeah. global agreements don't seem to do much good. So I, I think smaller and, and I have been, I now forgot the name of it, but Finland is part of a sort of lower level effort to integrate that is not going to the UN or some other yes. world organization, yeah. but actually yeah. operate on, a, on, a, on the next level down uh, the, and, and, and trying to get agreements and forget yeah. about America. If they don't come along, yeah. they don't come along, but we can't wait for them. And you know, mm -hmm. there's no point in saying, well, we, we, we are not going to clean up, the, clean up this thing uh, if America doesn't join us. I, I think we just have to go 
even Europe alone or, or smaller parties. And I'm pretty confident that the US will come along or making agreements with California or, or some progressive states like that. And, and then eventually the pressure will come. And, 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 uh, and that's, uh, this is just, a, a, I'm not an expert on this. And, and I don't want to take a stand, but I understand that actually the climate effects are much more local also than we tend to think. This is not in that sense a totally unified world. So if you do something in China, you know, in Beijing, Beijing will be better. And, and, and so I, I, somehow my instinct, and this is, this is just a hunch, I want to emphasize that, that, that going, going from smaller to, to bigger is a better approach. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, then I, I have one uh, last question for you. It's a big one, but we can move smoothly to the questions from the audience because there are quite a few. Uh, um, yeah, my last question was that uh, what would be the, um, what measures now to take next? What should be done during the next couple of months in, in Finland and Denmark? Um, do you want to start, Torben, with this <laughs> easy? <laughs> <laughs> the easy question <laughs> at the end here. Yeah. Well, um, given developments in, in recent weeks, then the most likely scenario for the next two months is that we are really fighting the coronavirus and we have restrictions. Maybe we will see a little bit back and forth with restrictions, but it's unlikely that within a two month horizon, we yeah. don't have any uh, any restrictions. Yes. So that's just the very short term uh, focus. Of course, we have discussed a little bit the design of these, uh, yes. the economic policy to deal with this, which is, which is important as the insurance part, but it also protecting uh, production capacity. And then the next phase is of course, to make sure that this capacity is used when we uh, reach mm. sort of more normal times. Um, yeah. The Danish perspective is that we have fiscal space to pursue a more expansionary policy. We also have a lucky punch, uh, the so-called holiday <laughs> pace, yes. which uh, some monies which have been frozen for other reasons and they are now unfrozen. And it has uh, this um, consequence, I think many countries would envy, namely that it would boost, uh, potentially boost uh, private uh, consumption but it also uh, uh, gives some uh, tax revenue because when you unfreeze these money, they are taxable income. So this is a measure, this is a very unusual measure, which is expansionary at the same time as it's yes. improving the budget. Yes. And we have now, uh, that's and basically five weeks. We have uh, unfrozen three weeks and I'm sure policymakers, they will also take the last two weeks yes. Uh, yes. as soon as possible. But that's a very short term uh, yes. thing, obviously. Yeah. Yes, and, and Danes have been shopping madly with the money. Many people like these yeah. money. Of course, some put them aside as a precautionary, uh, yes. but liquid saving, which they can yes. have accessible if, if they become unemployed or yes. whatever. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Bengt, what would you say? What should be done now? Winter coming, and maybe, like you said in the beginning, that the, the, the pandemic is gaining pace. On the northern hemisphere, Finland has been seems to to have slowed down a little bit, but this is in a very short window, so it could be even just data errors or something like that. But on the whole, one must say that with only seventy patients in in hospitals right now, yes. or something of that order, the it the pan, it's not a crisis, but this doesn't mean that once now is the moment, you know, to really prevent it and buy insurance by you know putting in, you know, masks and, and all the defensive measures we have, social distancing, because like we see in Denmark, suddenly something pops up and now the crisis is full blown. So don't wait. That's the message from seasonality. You, you just like you take flu shots, you should, you should be taking precautionary yes. measures now, not when it starts accelerating again. So yes. I, 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 that's my very strong uh, hope. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have now some questions here from the, the audience. Some are even quite specific. We could start with one of those. Um, um, Insurance-based general support to businesses to cover their losses has the obvious drawback of supporting in part lost causes and are thus partly waste of money. 
we talked about this earlier. What would a more uh, selective support look like at this point? Uh, what should be the criteria and the instruments? This is a huge specific question. Do you bank to want to, to comment first on, on, on this one? Well, in Finland, there is a group, you know, I was, our committee had a one month, uh, you know, duration. So, so we addressed mostly the insurance part, but we also recommended that the group would be put together that, that would, would look into the long term, sort of the looking forward thing. There's the insurance part, but then there's also the investment part. And uh, I'm not, uh, they haven't yet reported that, uh, but I, I, I imagine that they are looking at, you know, exactly this problem you are saying, how much to ensure possibly mm. the wrong kind of things and how much to actually yeah. encourage investment. So you, the longer this goes, the more you will look forward and not backward. And, and so the insurance component in that sense becomes smaller. Yes. But uh, I don't think this is the moment to tell exactly what one should do. But uh, I, I mentioned that that TESI, which is a Finnish organization, uh, a, a government organization, I think has is excellent in terms of, of, of has resources. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about human resources. And then yeah. we have, of course, uh, we have, of course, our startup world and so on that uh, we, Finland has, and I'm sure Denmark also has a lot of, of sort of skills about uh, kind of looking forward, investing in the new technologies moving forward. So that's what I would be looking yes. for. Yes, more the angle than the specific concrete. Yeah. Yes, yes. Torben, what, what do you say? Um, you were talking exactly about this mm. thing earlier that um, um, what to support and what not to yeah. support. And that's, that's clearly the difficult part here because these uh, packages, they are, they are backward looking in the sense that you compare the turnover or the revenue to some period in the past. Yeah. So they have this uh, status quo bias. I think it's important to distinguish between the direct support and indirect support via state guaranteed loans and guaranteed or so even uh, credit facilities to new yes. startups. Yes. And uh, clearly the, the, the subsidies, they have the, yes. they have the advantage that you quickly can, can give the support and you don't ask too many questions, you just uh, give them. But, but then the, the drawback is of course that you don't take a stand on the future of this uh, particular company mm -hmm. or, or the specific job. Uh, if you have um, uh, loans and guarantees even with some, not 100%, but some state guarantee, of course there would be a private uh, financial institution uh, making a, a due diligence of, of the, the firm and, and you, then you have this uh, kind of screening. So that's at least one way to avoid uh, too much sort of uh, waste in this. It's, it's easier said than done because you have this uncertainty about uh, the, uh, the duration of this uh, crisis. Right. It's much easier if it's just two or three months than if it's six or eight months. So yes. that's uh, still something we are, we are struggling with. Yes. And you were also talking about the exactly that it shouldn't be permanent, but then if the crisis continues, yes, yes. I have another question here from the from the audience that is connected to this one. Um, how the society can start to invest in change when there is so much investment already in the existing infrastructure and processes, uh, because uh, all those uh, resources have um, strong influence. Um, in the decisions. Bengt, do you want to, um, how, how to start to invest in change? I don't have really anything to add to what I said. You <laughs> I know, said but yes. it, these, are, these are partly, the, it's a matter of being able to evaluate. You, you Yes, like Torben said, the, the initial case is easy in one sense, which is you 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 could you could just go across the board and and, and give people money or companies money according to some formula. Finland didn't actually do quite that. I think it might yes. have been better to do that. Uh, but uh, but now when one looks forward, you really need to understand the details. And and I think the key is to have the human capital. There is money. The issue is not money, in my view. It, the issue is are there people who understand how to allocate the money? 
and and yes. I think I think that's the private sector primarily. Yes. Uh, that has to be, and and the 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 government can sort of piggy ride on the private sector. You know, yes. by, by if the yes. private sector yes. is willing to do it, then the government is always to uh, kick in sort of extra money. That's the model. Yes. Uh, my concern right. is a little bit that the private sector, there just isn't enough people that uh, are, are skilled yes. to, to do that right now. But, but you know, that's the, that's the bottleneck in my view. But, uh, and I'm, yes. sure, I'm sure this committee yeah. that's working on this problem has yeah. ideas, better ideas than I have. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, then the next question, uh, we can start with Tobin because you come the com com country of the um, Frugal four. Uh, what is your view on uh, European stimuli? Uh, this yeah. is about the 750 billion uh, recovery package. Yeah. You. And in relation to Denmark. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a uh, that's an interesting thing. This uh, which is now called the next generation EU, mm. and uh, which related to what we have been discussing here is trying to extend the solidarity or the insurance which we have within the national states to be uh, across the EU countries. Mm -hmm. The EU mm -hmm. system does not have such a, a mechanism. So this one has sort of been invented and it's new because the money uh, that's being borrowed. So that's also new for the, for the EU. And they are allocated um, according to some keys uh, which the, the, the simple version of it is that there's allocation from rich to less rich uh, countries in the EU and from countries which are not so hard hit by the crisis to countries which are hard hit by the crisis. And the last thing is definitely the insurance part. You can also ask, argue that the first part also has an insurance element. So, so that's uh, interesting. The big, uh, and, and these monies are, are given partly as uh, grants and partly as mm. uh, loans, but you have the advantage that this EU um, borrowing these money so it's to a much lower rate of returns than say the Italian or the Spanish state uh, can do it. Um, the big and now you asked about the <laughs> the opposition in for instance Denmark that's of course related to the allocation that many Danes are saying why should we pay to this because it's going to southern Europe and they should have uh, undertaken reforms uh, 10 years ago and so on. But I think it's interesting to discuss it from this insurance uh, perspective. And the critical element is that these money are supposed to be allocated contingent on undertaking reforms such that the economies would be better performing in, uh, in the future and not needing uh, support. That makes a lot of sense. The problem is whether the EU can actually uh, implement this. We have many examples in the EU of that type of contingencies in the stability and growth pact. Uh, you can also mention human rights uh, and so on, where in principle, you could sanction countries who do not do as they're supposed to do, but you don't do it at the end of the day because the political scene is as it is. In principle for these money under this so-called recovery and a resilience facility. Um, you will only get the money if certain milestones and targets are fulfilled. That sounds nice on paper, but the doubt and the huge question mark, would they ever decline any country yeah. in getting the money? Yeah. And then there's a risk that this is just financing something which would be undertaken anyway. And then the idea is really to show that EU is now in opposition to the financial crisis is not part of the problem, but part of the solution. Yes. But that depends on these programs being successful. And that's the big question. Yes, yes. So Danes don't quite think like Ben said earlier that we are a village and nobody should be left. Not all Danes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, not all Danes. Yes. Uh, Ben, what, what is your uh, view on the, the EU package, the 750 billion recovery package? Well, I think it comes with the fact that we are we are hinged to each other through the through the yeah, the same currency. Uh, mm -hmm. That's part yes. of it. That is, we can we can't if we had our own currency, then we could do different things. We could, you know, spend a lot and then inflate later, and 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 so on. You know, Sweden in that sense is perhaps in a better position. But uh, I think it it is essential that uh, that this gives space for for us to. 
let's say for Bank of Finland also to, yes. to support the government yeah. uh, buy up the bonds. You know, keeping interest rates low is a critical goal everywhere right now. And, and it's kept that low partly because uh, central banks are massively purchasing, uh, purchasing the debt. And, and uh, I see this in that context that it's part of that scheme of, of doing what the US is doing, which is, yes. which is you know, yes. the treasury and the, cent uh, the Fed are working together, really. Yes. That's unusual, very unusual. Yes. But, uh, but this, it needs to be emphasized. This, this pandemic is highly unusual. And you know, if you look at the Spanish pandemic, which killed 50 to 100 million people, this hasn't killed as many people, but it has, it has really done damage to the economy, which uh, the Spanish flu did nothing. So we are so highly dependent on each other, uh, which, which supports this idea that we have to insure each other also, because we went all, you know, off very far into the, out on the branch. And, yes. and with the assumption that we would be, we would be sort of, implicitly or explicitly insured through the financial markets largely, but the financial markets uh, can't insure everything. You know, governments are the ultimate insurers for, for aggregate risk. Yes, yes. Uh, do, would you see um, in connection to this and also what you mentioned earlier about in, in, in relation to the um, climate change, uh, would you see that there would be any new regional cooperation forming like new Nordics, the Nordics with the Baltic countries or Nordics together with Scotland, would that make sense from the uh, economic point of view in, in this connection or in the, yeah. I, you, I, you should ask the Viking, Torben. <laughs> yes, why, if the Viking could answer this. The Vikings have a long, they have a long standing connection with Scotland. Yes. yes. Yeah, and that oh, might yeah. uh, be relevant again if Scotland <laughs> <laughs> leaves the. Uh, but um, well, I, we all know all the problems within the EU and the differences mm -hmm. uh, north, south, east, west, and and so on. And uh, this is now reinforced with the the Brexit. I I think it's hard to predict what would happen. Uh, but I would like to come back to the point. Being, made earlier in terms of climate policy, because uh, I think it's important and I agree that this thing of having a global agreement or anything just coming close to a global agreement on this, which would be nice in theory, would not happen. What is more important to get into the action mode is really to have cooperation. And if some countries can cooperate, that can, that can change quite a lot, both for the countries, but also in, in sort of setting uh, examples. So I think that's uh, more important. That does not necessarily have to have, be, have to be uh, geographical neighbors who cooperate. It can also be uh, with some distance uh, in between. But, but mm. of course, there's some, uh, some scope in that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you very much. I think we, we leave it to the, this note. This was a very, very interesting uh, discussion, a very eye-opening and giving lots and lots of new ideas. So thank you very much, Tobin and, and, and Bengt and all the uh, participants. And um, I wish you all a good or at least a tolerable winter. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.